I greet you in the name of the Lord, brethren. Those of you who hear us on the live stream, <clears throat> we're glad to have you with us <clears throat> to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only true message that's heard in the world. <clears throat> My message this morning is on being begotten through the gospel. And this phrase is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now you know, the, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the context here. The Corinthian church <clears throat> had begun to, uh, there was a lot of sin going on in the Corinthian church. And they were in the process of falling away because they had gotten away from the gospel. They had begun to put more stock in worldly wisdom, in men's wisdom. And there was a lot of competition among the people in the church for different things. So Paul here, he's, he's correcting them. But in this particular passage here, he's, he's reasoning with them. He's asking them, as a father would speak to one of his own children, listen to me now. I'm the one that begat you. I brought you into this world. Listen to me. But it's not for that reason only that Paul says this. It's, and it's not because he's their Lord and their master. It's because of the life that he gave unto them. It's because of the life that they should listen to Paul. Because he be, had begotten them through the gospel. <clears throat> so he's telling them of his care for them as for his own children. And if there's any doubt that he has the right to say that he is father, again, he reminds us of this phrase, I've begotten you. It's, it's right for him to say, I'm your father, because I've begotten you through the gospel. You might have 10,000 instructors in Christ. Some of them might not even be living anymore, and they're still able to instruct us. But you don't have many fathers. You don't have many that begot you. <clears throat> and we might add that we highly value the ministry of those good instructors. <clears throat> but now your father, he's the one that, that sowed the seed that produced your life. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Corinthians, listen to me, listen to me. Paul planted and Apollos watered, but because of their faithful work and the good Corinthian soil, God gave the increase. I also want to establish here that it is not inappropriate for the Apostle Paul to speak of himself as a father in this way. Now we know, we're familiar with what Jesus said to his disciples, teaching them, he said, call no man your father. This is Matthew 23, beginning at verse 8. Be, ye, be not ye, don't, don't call yourself or allow others to call you rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man, don't call any other man, your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Now in this context, Jesus is referring to the scribes and the Pharisees who had made themselves lords over the people. That's the kind of father he's talking about here because they bound their own interpretations of the law and their own interpretations of Scripture upon the consciences of their hearers. Therefore, their hearers were bound to them personally. Not, see, the word wasn't all that important. It was that the Pharisees wanted to be the most important. They wanted to be the masters and lords of the people. And Jesus said, this is not, don't call any man father and don't you be called a father like this. <clears throat> In saying, yet have ye not many fathers, Paul's not talking about some personal authority that he had over the Corinthians, as if their consciences were to be bound to Paul alone, or as if he were their Lord and he was the master of their faith. But Paul's reminding Corinth who it is that begat them and who it is that truly cares for them, as a father cares for his children. And we know that he's not making himself to be Lord over them because just in the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, he says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, whom 
even as the Lord gave to every man. So every believer has this kind of a father that Paul's talking about. <clears throat> Paul was their father in this sense because he's the one, again, he's the one that had begotten them through the gospel. Now this is in quite a contrast to, for example, the popes <clears throat> who hold the titles Most Holy Father, Vicar of Jesus Christ, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church. Now that's the kind of father Jesus said, don't call any man father, which I find rather ironic that the present Pope, Pope Francis, who has taken this role and accepted these titles, Most Holy Father and Universal Pontiff, Pontiff of the Universal Church, says, who am I to judge, thou hypocrite? Call yourself these things, and then when someone asks what you think about the sodomites, you say, oh, who am I to judge? Anyway, back on track here. <clears throat> now, re religious cults also have this kind of father. There's a, a cult, is, I've never heard of a cult that didn't have a father like this. There was one man who was lord over everyone, even to, to the death. People follow him to their deaths. <clears throat> but now, this is not what Paul's talking about here. <clears throat> This is a term of care and affection. And in the previous verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, he says, But as my beloved sons, I warn you. <clears throat> now Paul also qualifies his words very carefully within the context of the one who is our Lord and our Master. In Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So by no means is the Apostle Paul trying to take all the credit this is actually a fairly complicated statement if you consider this. In Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul names three different things here involved in the new birth that the, that the Corinthians received. <clears throat> Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and the gospel. All three were required for the Corinthians to be begotten. Now, to give a quick summary of this phrase, what Paul is saying is that his role in begetting the Corinthian believers was that he labored for them and preached the gospel to them, which is the good word of reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ. That was the good seed that he sowed to the Corinthians. <clears throat> and when men believe the gospel and obey it, then God gives them life. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So Paul preached the gospel, but Jesus was the one superintending the entire thing. He sent the preacher. It's his gospel, which is the good news of what he has done, that the preacher declares. And all the work that takes place in the hearts of men that believe the gospel and the actual giving of life is done by Jesus Christ. God is doing everything through Jesus Christ. Without Christ, there would be no gospel, no sending, no preaching, no hearing, no believing. Now that's just a quick summary of this phrase, in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. But we're by no means finished expounding this matter. <clears throat> in order to be given life, men have to be brought into participation with Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> now he's the only man, he's the only man that God recognizes and blesses just merely by who he is. Now if you want life, you've got to be in him. Because he's the one, actually, he's the one God's looking at. He's the one bringing the sons to glory. <clears throat> he's the one that God's pleased with and the one that God loves and always has loved from before the foundation of the world. So because of Christ Jesus, God is able to fulfill his purpose in the salvation of men. Whoever does not honor the Son certainly will not be given life from God. Therefore, the one who does the begetting labors in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
he or she sows the good seed of the gospel with care and wisdom, knowing that sinners must be brought, must be gotten to the place where they are ready to be given life, ready to be born again. And this is not at all a simple matter. Repeating ritualistic phrases or saying a short prayer is not sufficient to persuade God to give life to the dead. The Father will not give you what he gave his only begotten Son until he sees his Son in you. And we're not begotten by any other means. <clears throat> in this phrase, in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, there is only one variable and two constants. <clears throat> now, the Apostle Paul was the variable. He was just one who fathered the Corinthians. <clears throat> but now we all have fathers that, that begat us too in the gospel. Now that's the variable. The other two were constants. It's always in Christ and it's always through the gospel. Those two things cannot be changed. <clears throat> Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring life to the fallen race of Adam. There's no other message, no other program or anything else that can do what the gospel of Jesus Christ does when it is preached and heard and believed and obeyed. <clears throat> Paul's not giving an example of just one of many ways to be begotten again. Paul's not talking about joining a religious club or getting a certain feeling or getting a certificate for completing the what we believe class. He's writing to the Corinthians about their birth. He's reminding them of their birth certificate. He's reading their birth certificate, if you will, about the transformation from being dead in sins to living with Jesus and having fellowship with the Father and the Son, which is eternal life. Jesus told Nicodemus in a very familiar passage, John chapter 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter again the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now Jesus said this, some 2,000 years ago, but a few years later, the Apostle Paul expounded upon this in the book of Romans. <clears throat> he expounded about how we were dead in Adam and what God did to remedy the situation, how we are born again in his epistle to the Romans. Now, I've heard a lot of people repeat what Jesus said to Nicodemus about being born again, but I don't hear a lot of people expounding or preaching what Paul said. He's expounding what Jesus said, which is the commission given to the apostles. They, they open up and expound what Jesus said and what Jesus did in the gospel. So let's listen now to what the apostle Paul says. <clears throat> to give life, and as the prophet Isaiah said, to bring to the birth is not a simple thing. It's not an easy thing as it's made out to be these days. Just because a preacher told some sad stories and you got emotional and cried and said a prayer, that does not mean you were born again. <clears throat> and just because someone talked you into being baptized does not guarantee that you were born again. No man ventures out on his own and obtains eternal life. No man decides when he will be conceived. And no man decides when he will be born. Life that is all life comes from God, and he is not the servant of man. He created man to serve his own purpose. Therefore, life must begin with God, and it is sustained by God, not man. God gives life when he wants to give life. He gives life in the way he has designed to give life. He gives life to whomever he wants to give life, and there is no other source of life. And preeminent in all of this consideration is his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So nothing self-generates. Some things in nature might appear to do it that way, but if we, if we were to examine closer, we'd find that it's, that's not so. <clears throat> the reproduction of life is always complex. There isn't anything that comes from nothing. 
Everything, and especially every living thing, came from another living thing. Not only is the origin of life traced back to God, but the present reproduction and sustenance of all life is in God. Nothing began of itself. No living thing regenerates or reproduces by itself. Now, I'm not a specialist in biology, but I know that you'll have to do some very diligent search to find if even anything like that exists that reproduces of itself. We're talking just one, one thing. God has created the world and the order of things in such a way that they display his own glory and the way that he works. So I want to look at some parallels here in nature. First, two of any species is required to procreate. Even in the insect kingdom, you got to have a daddy mosquito and a mommy mosquito. <clears throat> Birds, and spiders, fish, elephants, cows and chickens, dogs and cats, snakes and armadillos, they all require two. <clears throat> they all had a mother and a father that brought them into existence. And not only the animal kingdom, but the plant kingdom. The same thing is true. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. In other words, pretty soon you're going to run out of wheat. Because a seed, a, a seed has to fall to the ground and die, and it, included in this is a consideration of the soil and the sun and the water and care for it. See, life is complex. Life, it's all around us. We kind of assume because it, it appears to be automatic. It's just always there all around us, but it's not. It's all being sustained by God, and it's very complex. And the new birth certainly is no less complex. A seed came from a living plant, falls to the ground, and dies before it can live again and bear fruit. But if the seed doesn't get what it requires, proper soil, proper temperature, sunlight, water, etc., it remains dead. <clears throat> but even then, if it were to live and germinate and sprout, it's still not over. The complexity of it is still not over. Even some mature plants require additional outside help in the form of what we call cross-pollination. Sweet corn and apples, as well as many other trees, fruit trees and nut trees, and berries like blueberries and strawberries and more all require cross-pollination, help from another plant in order to continue producing fruit in abundance. And pollination itself is not an uncomplicated matter. If you remember from your junior high science class, it's even by the providence of God. <clears throat> pollination takes place by means of the wind blowing pollen or insects carrying it, like bees and butterflies and beetles. Or it can be transferred by birds or intentionally by people. When I was where I come from, corn detasseling was a common summer job. <clears throat> because cross-pollination causes the plant to produce more fruit. When God filled the ark with animals, there wasn't just one of each kind, but two and two, male and female of all flesh, came unto Noah and entered the ark, because life does not self-generate. One of the things that we can gather from all of this is that starting a new life is not a simple or easy matter. The stamp of God's divine mastery is written all over creation. Nothing comes into existence, lives, or multiplies independently of involvement from another life, and particularly the source of life. Amen. So when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, by no means was he suggesting that Nicodemus could take care of this all by himself. <clears throat> We've come to a time when church people seem to think that being born again is little more than saying a prayer or invite Jesus into your life. I'm not, what, what is that supposed to mean? Number one, you don't, if, you, if you don't already have Jesus, you don't even have life. And you don't invite him, he invites you. <clears throat> yes, you must be born again before you can see the kingdom of God, but you cannot do it by yourself any more than you could when your mother and father conceived you. Now let's distinguish also between life and birth. There is life long before a baby is born. When a husband and wife conceive a child in a moment, unseen, undetected, amazingly, a new life begins. 
And for approximately nine months, the child continues to grow in the womb and develop <clears throat> from a few cells into a baby that's ready to be born into the world, able to breathe, has arms and legs, hands, feet, fingers, feet, toes, <clears throat> ears, mouth, eyes, all the same internal organs, and is almost immediately able to eat. A lot of wonderful things had to happen before that baby was born. There was life, growth, development, systemic function, and preparation long before the baby was born. And the same principle is true for plants and animals and insects and microbes and on and on. Nearly everything that is living must go through some complex process in order to reproduce. There is life all around us, but none of it is automatic. Being born of God is no less amazing and no less complex because now we're talking about spiritual death and spiritual life. And not only that, I wanted to tie in something that Brother Dan brought up yesterday also, but this life is going to, this is going to come to life in the wilderness where there's no sustenance, in a hostile environment where there's dryness and barrenness that's opposed to life. So this makes it even more complex. It's not nearly as simple as a plant growing. What can change a sinner who is dead in trespasses and sins, alienated from God, with the wrath of God abiding on them? What can be done to bring that person into participation with Jesus Christ? What can be done that would cause God to look upon that sinner favorably and give them life? They have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus must be preached to them. This is how sinners are begotten again. The one who begets through the gospel is the one who preaches the gospel, like a father caring for his children. And in some cases, and we can even see this in scripture, it might happen relatively quickly. Or the preacher may have to labor for a time. But the status of sinners has to be made known to them by some means, and the remedy in Jesus Christ has got to be declared. It doesn't have to involve a pulpit or a fiery sermon, although it can, but the message of the gospel must be declared before there can be life given. Everyone that is born is begotten. Even Jesus, when he descended and humbled himself to come into the world, was begotten conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. There were certain ministers that were involved in, no, in your new birth. No one that I know of has ever been born again without being begotten by one of God's ministers. Again from 1 Corinthians 3, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I want to take special note here to say that, I, that the gospel is not only for the lost, and I know that you know that, but for, it's important that I say this because the emphasis of my message is being begotten, from going from death to life. So that's what I'm emphasizing here, but I want to make note that, that the gospel is not only for the lost. This is, this is what we live on. This is what we are sustained on. But I, for the purposes of this message, I'm talking about being given life. <clears throat> I also want to state that I'm not giving a formula. There's no formula that can give life either. Amen. God gives life, not men. When the gospel is preached to sinners, now a lot is happening unseen. There is a divine process involved that is not of this earth. God has intentionally made life complicated to reveal his own manifold wisdom. So when I say life, now I'm not... I'm. I am speaking about life that comes from faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said, in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. When the gospel of Jesus is preached faithfully, the whole Godhead gets involved in the matter. And I don't doubt the angels do too. Before the preacher is sent, Jesus has been working in the heart of the hearer. There's been preparation even before the word has been heard. Jesus sends the preacher, and he sends the right preacher, and he or she labors to declare the gospel, not even knowing the outcome of their labors. 
not knowing completely what's in the heart of the person they're speaking to, perhaps not even knowing the person at all. But behind the scenes, Jesus is working in all of it. The Holy Spirit is convicting of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Even, even though sometimes you may not say that as much as you'd like to, there, and you can read the record of this in the scriptures of the conversions of people. Some, some of the sermons were mighty short, but they did the work. But that's because it's in Christ Jesus. He's doing the work. <clears throat> Not only that, but he's helping the one doing the preaching, too. Giving wisdom and perception, giving the preacher the words to say. When the real gospel is preached, there's a lot of real grace that accompanies it. Now, it's very, we lament this, that there are some that do not believe. I'm not suggesting, again, this is not a formula that I'm preaching here, that if you, if you preach even the true gospel of Jesus Christ with power, there's no, I'm not guaranteeing that life's going to result because God oversees this whole thing now. So I, again, a caution. I'm not giving a formula or a guarantee here. We're, we're just speaking the truth. This is the way it, this is the way it works. This is the, what, what goes on. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, Peter and the other apostles told the people that the miracle of tongues, that they heard the wonderful works of God, each from their own nation, they heard it in their own tongue. Peter says, this is Christ Jesus who did this, whom the prophets foretold whom God raised from the dead, who we were witnesses of his, of his living. He walked among us and ate with us. We're witnesses of his resurrection, whom you have crucified. Now that was the, the sum, pretty much, of his message. Nothing elaborate, no tearjerker stories, no altar calls, <clears throat> no prayers were even made. But was the message effective? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? See, it was, it was in Christ they were begotten through the gospel. 3,000 people were begotten in a single day by the apostles. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip is sent to the Ethiopian eunuch, who just happened to be returning from worshiping in Jerusalem, and who just happened to be reading from the prophet Isaiah in what we call chapter 53. Now, there was a lot of preparatory work before Philip even got there, and Jesus sent Philip to him and preached the gospel to him, and the eunuch understood that participation with Christ was necessary, and he was baptized. Philip had begotten him through the gospel, and that didn't take very much time, now did it? I'm, I'm, what I'm showing here is that there's no pattern. This is, each of these cases was different from the other, but it's Christ working in all of it. In every conversion recorded, uh, pardon me, one more, Acts chapter 10. Cornelius, a Gentile, is a devout man that feared God. Now, how, how did he come to that? Who preached to him? What did he hear? How did he worship? What, why did he fear God? Why did he give alms? What? What provoked him to live in this manner? Well, there had been a lot of work done before Jesus sent Peter to him to preach the gospel. And not only Cornelius, but his whole household was begotten by Peter through the gospel in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, in every conversion recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus Christ is the focus of the preaching. Christ was honored so Christ blessed the preaching and the hearing. Christ was honored, he was believed on, and God gave life to the hearers. However, the preaching of Christ and the hearing by the believers was not the end of the matter. <clears throat> in each of these conversions, 3,000 at Pentecost in chapter 2, the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, Saul of Tarsus in chapter 9, Cornelius and his house in chapter 10, Lydia in chapter 16, the Philippian jailer and his house in chapter 16, all were baptized. Baptism is the moment of rebirth, as Paul very well expounds in Romans chapter 6. Oh, it's, again, another lament here that 
in the religious world, this is associated only with a certain sect. Now, this is the work of the devil, that the very, the very thing, the very moment, what God has ordained to give life in, Satan has caused a, to people to say, oh, that's, that's them. They, they teach that, and we're not of them, so we don't do that, and God doesn't give life. And churches are full of people who don't have life. They haven't been born again. And no commandment can give it to them. Men in the flesh make incorrect associations. Baptism is not associated with a certain religious sect. It's associated with life that God gives in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Why would any professed believer refuse to be baptized? This is very unreasonable. Either the gospel was not preached, or they heard it and didn't believe it. Baptism is the means of our initial participation with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. When the true gospel of Jesus is preached, baptism makes perfect sense. Amen. Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, wherein baptism also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It's what God does, just like all the other life we see around us. Who hath raised him from the dead? And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. If a person will not participate with Christ in his death, then God will most certainly not raise him with Christ. If a dead person, a dead person will not deny himself at the preaching of the gospel and gladly die with his Savior and Redeemer, then he is doomed to die the second death also. It is in Christ that we are begotten through the gospel. The preaching and believing of the gospel leads us to that wonderful place where God puts us in his son, where the life is, and that is when a sinner receives life. When a sinner is made aware of who they are by nature, where they will spend eternity, and what Christ did to redeem them, how could they refuse to die with Jesus? All that they think they're going to lose is going to pass away anyway. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Just a few weeks ago, I was discussing this with someone, and, and this is a brother. I, I appreciate this brother. It's someone I work with. But he, he said, this is a quote, baptism doesn't mean anything. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ, Amen. that doesn't mean anything? We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, not you and me together, you and him together, in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. <clears throat> now that explains why a lot of church people are still serving sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Life comes from God at the time and place and in the manner that he has designed. Life is the exclusive property and prerogative of God. There is no other person or name in heaven or in the earth or beneath the earth that can give life. This sounds elementary to state this, but men continue to fail to comprehend it and to believe it. 
As with everything else that is around us, men think that they can take charge of it and control it and reproduce it at their own will and especially to make some kind of profit from it. Whether it's a flower or food or the weather or a baby or being born again, sinful men have convinced themselves that it's all within their grasp and they can do it their way. Now Satan's the author of this. Salvation has been divinely engineered. We can see how creation has been divinely engineered. What limited knowledge we have of the natural things around us is wonderfully amazing because it all fits and functions together so perfectly. That is the mark of the divine. It has God's divine stamp on it. Everything involving salvation also has many, many connections and involvements that function and perfectly and amazingly. If anyone thinks that being born again is simple, consider these things that had to be done in order for you to be given life. First, there had to be an instrument already in place for sin to be taken away. That's before, before there was a gospel message to preach, sin had to be removed. Amen. That, we, con we continue to look into that for our, the rest of our lives, and I don't doubt eternity, we'll look into what, what happened when our sins were taken away. That had to be done before you could be given life. Before what God was willing to deal with you, that had to be done. God developed things on earth for over 4,000 years before he sent his son to make atonement for sin. Before our sin could be forgiven, deity had to come down from heaven to earth. You think this isn't complex? <clears throat> Jesus had to have a special body that was made to bear the sins of the whole world and to be cursed of God. Expound that for a while. He had to descend into the grave, rise again from the dead, and ascend up into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. All power in heaven and earth had to be given to Jesus before anyone could be given eternal life and God had to be satisfied and blessed the Holy Spirit had to be made willing to work with you first God had to have first chosen you God had to first call you you had to have heard the truth the gospel and not a lie some preacher of the gospel had to be sent and he had to preach the gospel God had to give you to believe the message of the gospel the Holy Spirit had to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. God had to grant you repentance. There had to be life in Jesus before it could be given to you. You had to be buried with Christ and raised with Christ. <clears throat> now these are just some of the complex details of what's required for one of Adam's sinful race to be made alive, to be begotten. <clears throat> and each one of these things and much more, you know, can be expounded and is taught in scripture. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. If Jesus had to bear the curse for our sins and be crucified in order to gain the approval and favor of God, and he did, that was the commandment given to him to lay down your life and take it up again, then God will not give anyone life who does not honor his son. More specifically, if you have not died with Jesus, God has not raised you with Jesus. That's what Paul is expounding in Romans chapter 6. And this is not an outline for a procedure to follow that we're talking about here. Paul is expounding how God puts men into Christ and gives them life. He is expounding how life is given from God and in Christ. He is expounding how the new birth occurs that Jesus told Nicodemus about. <clears throat> the preaching of the gospel requires, <clears throat> pardon me, prepares sinners for God to give them life as well as sustains that life. How can a man be born again? God puts you into Christ where the life is. There is no life outside of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Outside of Christ, all men are dead and condemned the believers who preached this gospel of Jesus Christ to us have begotten us through it. 
Faith causes men to reason that if God raised up Jesus from the dead, and if I resign to dine with Jesus, I know God will do as he promised and raise me to live with him. Amen. Is it quick? Is it easy? Is it simple? No, it's not. God doesn't do anything like that. But especially not putting sinners into Christ and giving them life. <clears throat> Nothing about it is simple. It has God's divine mark of marvelous and amazing and wonderful on it. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. In Christ Jesus, we have been begotten through the gospel. Amen. Amen.